Thank you. Make some noise for that choir, y'all. That was beautiful. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for the introduction, uh, Mr. Keith Lane, to the planning committee, uh, the employee choir, Pastor Douglas, um, county commissioners and city council members, Mayor Shul, and to all the employees and community members in attendance, what King would have called our beloved community. Uh, and especially thank you to my wife of 10 years, Catherine Freeland, who's here. She helped me with my speech. <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's an honor to be here today and speak about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I want to open up the space with some words of wisdom from a very distinguished African-American humanitarian and philosopher. And if you know these words, feel free to speak them with me. <clears throat> Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday, happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. All right, now, for those of you in the room who have never been to a black cookout, a fish fry, or family reunion, that was the black birthday song. And if you're not immersed in our culture, you might not even know we had our own version of the birthday song. But uh, we actually have black versions of a lot of things. <laughs> a few moments ago, uh, the, the Durham City County Employee Choir blessed us with a beautiful rendition of the Black National Anthem, otherwise known as Lift Every Voice and Sing, written by James Weldon Johnson. Thank you again for that. It's so beautiful. Uh, I, I saw some of y'all know all three verses. <laughs> Chief Davis. <laughs> okay. Uh, we also have our very own short month. That'll be next month, Black History Month, founded by Carter G. Woodson. And if you were wondering when uh, Rich White Heterosexual Men's Month is, that would be March, April, May, June, July, <laughs> August, September, October, November, and January. Okay. So my question is, does anyone know who wrote that Black Birthday song? Stevie Wonder, right. Birthday was a single from Stevie Wonder's 1981 album, Hotter Than July. And Birthday was actually a rallying call, an anthem demanding that Congress recognize Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday as a federal holiday. Now let's check out some of the lyrics from that song. Everybody knows the chorus. These are the lyrics from uh, verse 1. I just never understood how a man who died for good could not have a day that would be set aside for his recognition. Verse 2. You know, it just doesn't make much sense. There ought to be a law against anyone who takes offense at a day in your celebration. That's right. It's hard to imagine today, but some people took offense at the idea that we would honor someone like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with a national holiday. They thought he was unworthy of such recognition, unqualified to join the likes of people like George Washington and Christopher Columbus to have their own paid holiday. Two years after Stevie Wonder's anthem hit the airwaves, President Ronald Reagan reluctantly signed a bill that created a federal holiday in King's honor in November of 1983. I was born one month later, right here in Durham, in December of 1983, so I've never known life without Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I've always admired and loved King, not just because we're both Capricorns, but because of what he stood for. And I grew up assuming that everyone considered him to be a hero and a humanitarian and a patriot, just like I did. It wasn't until later in life that I learned that King was actually a controversial figure, that people had to struggle for his birthday to be recognized as a national holiday, that President Reagan was initially against the idea, and that organizers had to rally over six million signatures to petition Congress. This was the largest petition in favor of an issue in the history of the United States. And I didn't realize that Stevie Wonder was actually putting his neck on the line to make a political statement about Dr. King. Now, artists have always been at the vanguard of social movements. We are often burdened with the responsibility of stating the obvious, whether it's Billie Holiday's indictment of black bodies swinging from trees like strange fruit, Nina Simone's very blunt, and excuse my French in church, Mississippi goddamn, or Sweet Honey in the Rock whose music provided a soundtrack to the civil rights movement. We have a rich legacy of artists, activists, and cultural alchemists who have shaped change through their art. And Stevie Wonder is a part of that legacy. 
What was perplexing to me was that there was a time right here in this country when people needed to be convinced that King deserved a holiday. And there was a whole lot of pushback who, from folks who thought King was a traitor and a communist, a troublemaker, a rabble rouser, and a criminal. Some of the biggest opposition was right here in the state of North Carolina, where the late Senator Jesse Helms condemned King for his radical political views. Helms said, a federal holiday should be an occasion for shared values. But King's very name itself remains a source of tension. He is a deeply troubling symbol of a divided society. Now, this is one of the most powerful Republican senators of his time. He accused King of, quote, using nonviolence as a provocative act to disturb the peace of the state and to trigger, in many cases, overreaction by the authorities. Now, this is a dangerous, dangerous rhetoric and an example of victim blaming, where people are being oppressed or blamed for instigating the state violence that is inflicted upon them. And Helms was a master manipulator, a forefather of today's resurgent white nationalist movement. And it's important to remember how threatened he was by King's so-called radical political views. I'm here today to celebrate those views. Here are some of King's quotes from his uh, famous I Have a Dream speech. <clears throat> Quote, now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. I have a dream that one day right here in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. Now today we would ask ourselves, what's so radical about that? But let's look back at Jesse Helms. In a political ad against his liberal opponent, Frank Porter Graham, Helms warned white people to wake up before it's too late. Do you want Negroes working beside you, your wife and your daughters and your mills and factories? Frank Graham favors mingling of the races. To Helms, integration was dangerous, something to be feared. And he used the media and strategic bigotry to fan the flames of white nationalism. Now let's look back at King and some of his more radical views. Quote, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, in a modern context, that sounds a lot to me like Black Lives Matter. King also warned, the whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. Now we're getting radical. He was warning of rebellion here, an uprising if we don't see justice. And he wasn't just talking about Jim Crow, especially closer to his death, King became, became increasingly anti-war as he moved from civil rights to one of the root causes of oppression, poverty. King understood that poverty is a policy choice, and to attack poverty is to attack the status quo and its underlying architecture of white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism, and that scared the crap out of people like Jesse Helms. Following King's I Have a Dream speech, the FBI circulated a memo, and I quote, in light of King's powerful demagogic speech yesterday, he stands head and shoulders above all other Negro leaders put together when it comes to influencing great masses of Negroes, we must mark him now, if we have not done so before, as the most dangerous Negro to the future of this nation from the standpoint of national security. The I Have a Dream speech made King a national security threat, public enemy number one. And he was the exact age that I am now, 34 years old. If the I Have a Dream speech was given today, King would be called what we consider today a millennial. And that fact is important. Let's talk about millennials for a second. Durham has grown fast in recent years, and our demographics are shifting to the point where the median age in Durham is now 32 years old. And this is an interesting age. These young, rabble-rousing 20, 30-somethings have always been more willing to believe that another world is possible. There's a West African philosophy called Sankofa. It means you need to look back in order to move forward. When I look back, I see my wife's grandfather, Samuel DeWitt Proctor. He was the president of North Carolina A&T. They called it A&T College at the time, when four students decided to sit down at the Woolworths counter in Greensboro, launching a national sit-in movement. Now, a section of that historic lunch counter is one of the exhibits at the Civil Rights Museum about an hour up the road from here. 
My father had the privilege of designing that museum. And those four kids, they were 18, 19 years old, and they did something reckless. They broke the law. They risked their lives to demand equal rights. Over in Raleigh, Ella Baker led SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. These were college students, kids with a vision to change the world. Right here in Durham, Douglas E. Moore was a 29-year-old minister who led the Royal Ice Cream Sit-In, which would plant the seeds for the Greensboro Four. I say all this to say, young black North Carolinians were the lifeblood of this national movement. And in our current moment of Black Lives Matter and the Me Too and Time's Up movements, New human rights icons are emerging, such as Colin Kaepernick and Tarana Burke. Cultural activists such as hip-hop artists Rhapsody and Kendrick Lamar and J. Cole are speaking truth to power through their music. And as President Trump virulently lashes out at black people and women in the trans community, and now I hear Jeff Sessions is coming for weed smokers, here we are again, <laughs> having a national conversation about race and patriarchy and social justice and human rights. And just like King's time, North Carolina is still at the center of it, from the uprisings in Charlotte to the Confederate monument that was torn down right here in Durham. Now, I don't know if y'all heard uh, President Winfrey at the Golden Globe Globes this week, <laughs> but she said something very important. She says, speak your truth. Can I speak my truth today? Are y'all ready? I'm gonna speak my truth now. All right. It was a reckless, rabble-rousing, troublemaking millennial with radical political views who climbed a ladder and tied a noose around the boys who wore gray. Takiya Thompson, a queer, black, North Carolina Central University eagle. She stands on the shoulders of Harriet Tubman, who broke the law and destroyed property for our freedom. She stands on the shoulders of Durham's own Pauli Murray, who was arrested for sitting in the white section of a Virginia bus and who coined the term Jane Crow, prophetically alluding to the nuanced intersections of race and class and gender. Indeed, she stands on the shoulders of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, the whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerge, emerges. Standing on the shoulders of our ancestors and standing firmly in the principles of equality, and justice and freedom and community, beloved community, I thank God we still have folks who are willing to risk their freedom and their lives to stand up for what's right. Now stay with me now. Y'all remember Sankofa, the West African philosophy that says you need to look back to your past in order to move forward to your future. I have a question for the city and the county of Durham. What side of history do we wanna be on? Do we wanna be on the same side of history as the Woolworth Company? which, by the way, was just enforcing the law and denying those four a and students a soda and a cheeseburger? Do we want to be on the same side of history as the bus driver in Montgomery who was in line with the law of his time and hauling Miss Rosa Parks off to jail? Mark my words, 50 years from now, they will put that crumpled up boys who wore grace Confederate statue and others like it in one of my father's museums. They will be talking about Takiya Thompson and Brie Newsom like we talk about the student protesters of Tiananmen Square in Beijing and the Soweto student uprisings protesting apartheid South Africa. Now, I mentioned Brie Newsom. She's another millennial activist who scaled the flagpole in South Carolina State House to rip down the Confederate battle flag. For that act of civil disobedience, she was arrested for trespassing, destruction of public property, and defacing monuments on Capitol grounds. These women are our generation's Rosa Parks. Colin Kaepernick is our generation's Muhammad Ali, and Black Lives Matter is our generation's civil rights movement. And I asked my ancestors this morning, I did some prayer. I said, can I speak my truth? And they gave me their permission. Baba Chuck, Auntie Maya Angelou, Granny Franny, Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, can I speak my truth? Durham, can I speak my truth? Yes. All right. Because King has a message for Durham. During Jim Crow, those segregation laws were not worth the paper they were printed on. The laws were not based in any valid principle. They were written to denigrate, disgrace, insult, and remind black people of our subservience. And I maintain that the same is true for the boys who wore gray. When I heard that it was valued at $71,000, I said, by who? Who did the appraisal? Show me the receipts. 
That sheet metal statue crumpled as soon as it hit the ground like aluminum foil that just sort of collapsed under its own weight. And it's part of the justification for the felony charges being brought up against those who pulled it down. Now, I'm not saying the folks who tore down the statue shouldn't be held accountable. They knew what they were doing was controversial and illegal. Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, Aung San Suu Kyi, Gandhi, Jesus, even our very own mayor, Steve Shul, was arrested for civil disobedience. There's a consequence to civil disobedience, and that's what makes it a sacrifice. I'm just saying, in my opinion, they don't need felony charges. They were just redecorating public property. <laughs> that's all. Now, in all serious, I'm, I'm going to be really vulnerable with y'all for a minute. <clears throat> As an African who will never know the true names of his ancestors, whose great-grandparents were enslaved by boys who wore gray, whose grandfather grew up sharecropping on a plantation in Scotland Neck, North Carolina, where a holocaust is celebrated as Southern culture. I didn't even realize at the time how much psychic weight I was carrying until that heavy lump of metal and stone hit the ground like a meteor and sent shockwaves through our collective consciousness. It was an overwhelming existential experience. I could actually hear my ancestors rejoicing. And if we want to think about an appropriate consequence, we should consider giving them a key to the city. This is just the opinion of a lifelong Durham millennial resident. But keep in mind, we are the fastest growing demographic in the city, the largest voting bloc in this country. We are the future leaders of Durham, of North Carolina, and of the United States of America. All right, I'm almost done. Here's a fun fact. Did you know that the states of Alabama and Mississippi have a different name for MLK Day. They call it Robert E. Lee and Martin Luther King Day. Why? Because they petty. <laughs> they heard the Stevie hit on the radio, they saw the writing on the wall, and they were mad because they were forced to celebrate King. So they chose to insult his legacy by pairing his birthday with the Confederate generals. They wanted to remind black people of our inferiority but times are changing. In Arkansas, the federal holiday was first recognized in 1985 and has always been called Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday and Robert E. Lee's birthday. That's the official name. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday and Robert E. Lee's birthday. That is until 2017. After decades of static bigotry, they finally changed the name to Martin Luther King Jr. Day within months of our monument coming down. Now, King has words for why this is the case. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, King said, We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frank, clap it up for King. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I've heard the word, wait. It rings in the ears of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Civil rights leaders have been fighting for decades to have Confederate monuments come down, to have buildings renamed and historical injustices addressed. And King taught us that you can't always work within the system. Just look at Durham. 24 hours after our Confederate monument came down, what happened? Governor Roy Cooper called for all monuments to come down. Now that is worth repeating. 24 hours after Durham's Confederate monument came down, Governor Roy Cooper called for all Confederate monuments to come down. Not because the General Assembly allowed it, not because the city council made an ordinance, but because the people of Durham took action and I maintain that civil disobedience is the highest form of patriotism. Now, one more time, let's wrap it up. Let's look back to move forward, Sankofa. Let's look back to the Stagville Plantation in North Durham, one of the biggest plantations in the state. Let's look back at our legacy of enslavement and tobacco. Let's look back at Julian Abel, the architect of Duke Chapel and much of Duke University's campus who wasn't even allowed into the buildings he designed. 
Let's look back to urban renewal and how Highway 147 opened the veins of the Haytai neighborhood in Black Wall Street. Let's look back at the racist housing policies such as steering and redlining that stymied the establishment of a black little class. Let's look back to the rampant gentrification, divestment, the destruction of uh, housing projects, and discrimination in our departments, campuses, neighborhoods, and communities. We don't just need to tear down the Confederate monuments. We need to tear down the systems of white privilege. We need to tear down the xenophobia and the Muslim phobia. We need to tear down the deportation and the targeting of our Latinx community. We need to tear down HB 142 and LGBT phobia. And to all the men in this room, we need to tear down our toxic masculinity, patriarchy, and sexism. We need to tear it all down so that we can create something that is more just, more equitable, liberating for everybody, especially those pushed to the social margins, because that's what King would have wanted us to do on his birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The applause of the audience speaks it all, but on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you for speaking your truth to us today and to Durham.